Good morning, Song of Hope Church. Good morning. I know we've been running around here scrambling, trying to get sound and different things like that. Make sure we're keeping some of our fellow members in prayer here this morning. We're missing a few people here this morning, so we just ask that you lift them up in prayer. Be thinking about those who could make it here today. Um, we just pray that the Lord just watches over them, keeps them. If they're feeling bad, uh, blesses their health this morning. Um, we're missing half of our, some of our sound team, so we're trying to put everything together. And if you don't hear us quite as well, then hopefully you hear just enough. Amen? Amen. Well, welcome to Song of Hope Church, where we like to say around here that as long as you trust and believe in the Lord, He will always give you a song of hope in your heart. Amen? Amen. All right, well, we got a lot of things on our plate today um, that we want to talk about, but we're going to get to that a little bit later. Uh, but one of the things I want to say is please join us on our um, Facebook page, and also we have a YouTube page, and then we also have a website. It's songofhope.info. So just go to songofhope.info and, um, and see what we're doing throughout the week, throughout the year. Uh, and there's a lot of changes coming up that uh, you'll soon find out about, but we just hope that you're having a blessed day. Amen? All right, so let's get to it here. One of the things we like to do is we feel that uh, it's therapeutic in the touch. So everybody stand up, greet your neighbor, and we'll continue. Amen. And I'm going to say hi to those out there that are watching remote. Sister Carolyn, good morning, unit. Enid, good morning, mom and dad, good morning. Let's take a steady of me as we praise and worship. 
worship the Lord. I don't know what kind of week you've had this week, what's been going on in your life, but let me tell you, we want to give the Lord all the praise, all our offering of love and worship to him. Amen? This song says, my life belongs to you. You are my God. There is none
you may take over my life, Lord. Order my steps in your ways. Give me strength when I run out of strength of my own. Lead me and guide me, Lord. That supernatural thing that you do. Sometimes it's just a you prompt us to turn right or to turn left according to your will. We're so thankful, Lord, for those things in our life that we thought we could never overcome. But yet, as the pastor would say, but God, that's all you got to do. You can say, Lord, I got all this stuff, but God. Lord, I don't think I'm worthy, but God. Lord, how am I going to get through this issue, through these problems? But God, once we put his name in there, the circumstance changes. At the name of Jesus Christ, the story changes. Amen. Woo, what a good God we serve. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another day. Thank you for shining your wonderful, glorious light this morning, bringing the sun up. We thank you for loving us the way that you do, Lord, with that unconditional love. The grace which we've been praising and worshiping and singing about, Lord, that you give us each and every day. We, we're so thankful. We want to lift up those that are dealing with health issues and different things, Lord, um, throughout this country, throughout the world. Lord, especially India, they need some help, Father. Yeah. But at the name of Jesus Christ, woo, yeah. the story changes. Isn't that something? You can say anything you want to do. You can do anything you want to do. But at the
for allowing us to praise and worship him. We truly mean it, Lord, that you can use us. You plus one of us is going to be the majority. If it's just me and you, Lord, I'm the majority. Because I got you in my life. I want you, each and every person, at the sound of my voice, if you know, if you trust in God, that's all it takes is you plus God. Not our eyes are stacked in your favor. No eyes can outbeat those eyes. Lord, thank you for allowing us to praise and worship your name. I'm so grateful for another day. You know, with all this electronic stuff we had going crazy with us this morning, God still found a way for us to praise and worship his name. You know, it doesn't matter whether we got electronic equipment or we just sitting out here singing on the side of the road or in the house or in the car. God is good and he can use you, church. We're thankful for this wonderful day. All right. Well, you know, I was going to say, we need to get our ushers in place, but I don't know if we got ushers in the house today. Amen. Yes, we do. Brother Terry. Boy, Brother Terry, that's a good brother right there. Let me tell you something. He has like 12 jobs here at the church. Amen. Sister Paul, I want to say good morning to you too. I say good morning to you this morning. Amen. Carrie around here, I want to say good morning to you too, I think. And Giselle and Genevieve, I didn't see your smile face. I want to say good morning to you too. Junior Lee, I want to say good morning to you too. All right. Let's get ready for our praise. I mean, actually, for our offering this morning. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for another day. We're thankful for all the things that you provide in our lives. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards of what you've given us. Lord, we pray you bless this tithe and offering 30, 60, 100 fold, that it may be used for the goodness of your kingdom and the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Bless your people this morning. Bless this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's on up here. Well, I don't know if you can hear me on out there in streamland, but um, we're, we have some technical difficulties with sound today, so we're still doing a sound check on my mic. It's a little short in folks today, like uh, Mike said. Some, uh, some folks can't make it. Some aren't feeling well. So hopefully we can get this working. Amen. Well, I have some. Man, I can Mike? Do you know? Can they hear me here on a? Yeah, yeah, they can. Okay, but and now you guys can hear me. So I just wanted to say a couple of announcements real quickly. Next week Sunday, we for Mother's Day, we're going to be at the Way. Uh, <laughs> Sunday. That'll get everybody up. We want to make sure y'all hear the message so we can give you a good earache before I get started. <laughs> Apologize. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, as I was saying, we'll be out the way for ministries next Sunday. We're going to share a service with them. They came over here a few weeks ago, and so we decided to do Mother's Day together in their new building. They just got a new building. This stuff will be on our website and it'll be on our Facebook page if you need the address. But uh, most of you who live here in Vancouver will know 
uh, the old Blockbuster building on Patton Parkway at 136, uh, in that kind of little strip mall, I believe. Um, the address is 13600 Northeast 84th Street, building number six. Um, uh, so uh, I didn't get the time of the service. Um, anybody know what time? Uh, the other problem is that uh, uh, we're out of town this week uh, for a wrestling tournament, so I didn't get a chance to talk to Damon. Um, but anyways, I'll have that on the website as well. Apologize for that. A lot of things are moving really fast, and um, so it's hard to kind of keep up. One of the things I hadn't had an opportunity to share with our church yet was that, uh, I don't know if everyone knows this, but they sold this building. Um, and so initially, we, we, we were supposed to have between one and two years to find another place. Well, probably about a month ago, they came and... Uh, Sheila came and talked with me and said that they had sold it and we had until June 30th uh, to find another building. So we're, we're doing that right now. In fact, we have some things in, in progress and I'll let you know more about that when they're definite. Um, so uh, some change is coming. Uh, particularly uh, the, the most uh, important one right now is next week Sunday we'll be at the Way Ministries new building at 13600 Northeast 84th building number six, right by Patton Parkway, uh, 136. I don't know how that works, but <laughs> it's it's right over there. Amen. I think that's, and then we'll have communion today. So praise God, this is communion Sunday, first Sunday uh, of the month, and I'm excited to, to take communion together. It's always a blessing to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Amen? Um, okay, I think that's all the announcements. So I want to go ahead and get into the Word today. I'm going to do something a little different. I feel like the Lord was just impressing some things on my heart, and I'm just going to uh, just really kind of share with you right from the Scripture uh, what I think He was sharing um, for us this week. Particularly, um, how many of you know that when we became born-again Christians or when we said yes to Jesus and made him our leader, that we were enrolled in or drafted into a ministry called the Ministry of Reconciliation. How many of you know that? That's, we are in a, you know, sometimes we use the illustration of an army, but particularly we are part of the Ministry of Reconciliation. We are called, first of all, we were reconciled to God. We were, God made up with us. And then he gave us the authority as ambassadors, the scripture says, for people to represent him to go out and reconcile with others and reconcile them with God so that we have a particular, um, we have a, a, a calling. So I just wanted to uh, draw attention to that. So, if you'll turn with me in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, I'm just going to start with one verse, and then we're going to bounce down to uh, chapter 5. But chapter 4, verse 7, uh, if you find that in your word, if you can. I'm uh, using the NIV as well as the new, inter the new uh, uh, what is it? The New uh, Living Translation, which is really, um, I like the way it says some things, so I wanted to draw some attention to them today. So let's go ahead and go to uh, verse 7. It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. And then if you would go over to um, chapter 5, verse 7, it says, We live by faith and not by sight. 
And we, re- we live by faith, not by our feelings. We don't, we, we don't live our life based on all the circumstances going around, on around us, but we live by faith in the resurrected one. Amen? And so that's the basis, particularly for our ministry of reconciliation. I just wanted to add, say that in the beginning because I want to walk down here now to verse 11 of chapter 5. And that's really the core of our text today. It says we are, in verse 11 it said, it's because we know this solemn fear of the Lord that we work so hard to persuade others. This is a New Living Translation. God knows we are sincere and I hope you know this too. Are we trying to pat ourselves on the back again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart before God. If it seems that we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. If we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Whatever we do, it is because Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for everyone, we also believe that we have all died to the old life we used to live. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live to please themselves. Instead, they will live to please Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks about them. Once I mistakenly thought of Christ that way, as though he was merely a human being, how differently I think about him now. What this means is that those who belong to but become Christians become new persons. They are uh, not the same anymore, for the old life is gone, a new life has begun. All this newness of life from God, who brought us back to himself through what Christ did, and God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors, and God is using us to speak to you. We urge you, as though Christ himself were here pleading with you, be reconciled to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And then just the first part of uh, chapter 6, and uh, God's partner And as God's partners, we beg you not to reject this marvelous message of God's great kindness. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, God is ready to help us right now. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Let's just have a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you today, Lord. I know there's a lot of... um, a lot of turmoil, Lord, surrounding uh, us spiritually right now, God, and I know there's been a lot of attack this morning, but God, I I still want to focus on your word and share what I believe you put in my heart, and God, I pray that you'll just uh, give us a fresh breath of revelation, Lord, of being able to see a calling that you have placed on each of our lives to be that person, Lord, that can be used by you to bring people back to you and to heal relationships between people, Lord God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to start in in chapter 4 with the idea that uh, we have this treasure in jars of clay um, because it says something very significant which is important for everything I want to say from this point forward. Um, Uh, So it says to show that this all-surpassing power is from God. So he's saying basically we are vessels of clay. And the illustration from back in the New Testament was really simple. People used to take really valuable stuff and hide them in old clay jars. Because on the outside they looked like they were worthless. So no one would bother to look there for a valuable. So they they put stuff in there and and that's where they keep it safe. Probably still do that today. Um, But the idea is that God took us... And he put in us some valuable stuff. And, and I'm saying this because in order to do what I'm going to talk about today, to, as we watch it unfold in Scripture, you have to have the power of God. You have to have an ongoing, living, thriving relationship with the Holy Spirit, or you won't be able to do it. You will be stuck powerless. You won't have the power to 
reconcile. You won't have the power to take those. When things are perplexing, you won't have the power to go through. When things get difficult, you won't have the power to keep going because you need that from God. God is not, uh, he hasn't just given us a, a, a ministry without giving us the preparation to make it happen. And so that's why when you move over to uh, chapter five and you see where he says, we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would rather prefer to be away from the body than at home than at home with the Lord. He's talking about this idea that we don't live here by what we see. I mean, you really have to get this in your heart so that when you live your life, it's, it's the principle that, that, that you're living on because it's so easy to get distracted by what you can see. You can't see heaven. You can't see Jesus. You can't see the Holy Spirit. It's by faith that we see them. And God may open a, a revelation to you and let you see some things, and that's great. But in, in, in totality, our walk is, is by faith. It's not by what we see. And unfortunately, a lot of times when we get stuck focusing on the things we can see, we don't have the power to trust God to move from a place we can't see. Does that make sense? And so that's why he's, he's saying to us, look, look, you guys, you're like you're earthen clay jars. But in you, when you receive me, I put something super valuable in you, super powerful. You just have to begin to see it and you have to begin to live by it. Live under the authority of, of God. Live allowing him to move through you to reconcile you to him and uh, one to another. So when we get down to the scripture, uh, so hopefully we can get an idea here of what I'm trying to get at. It is because we know this solemn fear, verse 11, of the Lord that we work so hard to persuade others God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we trying to pat ourselves on the back again? No, we are, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us so that you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart before God. So even back in the first century, and, and you need to get a hold of this right now in our country, around the world, there's, these, there's spectacular ministries. Now, I'm not saying spectacular ministries are bad. I'm saying if a spectacular ministry isn't, at the heart of it, it isn't that they're sincerely serving the Lord, then it's a distraction. It's a distraction, amen? He says, and Paul says, we are not a spectacular ministry. We have a sincere heart before God. How does that look, a sincere heart before God? The things of God come first. The focus isn't on the, how good is our worship team, how good can the pastor preach, is he, can he make you laugh, can he entertain you, uh, do we have enough uh, fellowship with enough coffee and donuts, uh, whatever. You know, it's about us serving the Lord in the vein or the way that Paul did. He sets himself up as an example. He says, I'm not patting myself on the back. I want you to see I live a life that I'm reflecting as a leader how we should all live, saying to the Corinthians, because by now, people have moved into Corinth and had started these other ministries that were taken away from the true gospel, and we're seeing that today. And that's why I'm, I think it's imperative that you hear the message as, as, as in our country, you see there's so many people saying things in the name of Jesus that are not even scriptural, not even biblical. And some of them are some biblical, but not all. It's like you really have to have a, a good understanding of the fundamentals of what the Word of God says, and you have to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit to give you the discernment to hear the truth and to stand up for it and to speak it when God commands you to. And I said command when he commands you to. There are times when he says, you need to do this. And we need to have the heart and the guts, the commitment to do what God asks us to do. We won't be able to do that if we're part of a spectacular ministry. Pretty soon all that really matters is having a good time in church, having a lot of people at your church. That's not bad. I'm not saying that at all. I'd love to have a full house as long as it was a full house of people who were committed to having a sincere heart before the Lord. 
willing to take the chances, willing to step up to the plate. And I'll show you what I mean in a couple of minutes. So then he goes on in verse 13, he says, it seems that we are crazy. If it seems that we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. So when he said this, he's saying, some people think we're crazy. Well, why would people think they were crazy? Why would people think Paul was crazy? Well, he was saying he sees something that people can't see. He's saying Jesus rose from the grave. He's saying that he'll die for Jesus. He said he'll live for Jesus. It doesn't matter if he lives or dies. And some people say, man, that's crazy. And some people are going to say, wow, that's the gospel. So that's what he says. It doesn't matter whether you think I'm crazy or if you think this is what I'm in my right mind. That doesn't matter. What matters is um, whatever we do it is because Christ's love controls us. So no matter how you see Paul, Paul saying, or you could say me, I'm a, I'm a leader, and I believe I want to follow in Paul's vein, and wh what you need to see when you see me is a simple thing of this, that I want to do what Christ wants me to do. I want his love to control me. I want his love to control you if you're in this church. I want you to be able to stand up for his love, and that's not easy. I want to take, for instance, relationships in our country regarding culture, race, and um, uh, ethnic origin, and all the different places that people come from. And now, when we stand up, we've got all kinds of people arguing and fuss with one another about our differences. What are you going to do when you have to stand up for the love of God, and you have to say the unpopular thing? Are you going to be silent, or are you going to speak up? Are you going to stand for the, and bring glory to God, or are you just going to allow yourself to be silenced? Are you going to let Christ's love control you? And here's what I mean by Christ's love controlling you. He says, since we believe that Christ died for who? Everyone. Christ didn't just die for Native Americans, he didn't die for Hispanics, he didn't just die for African Americans, he didn't just die for Europeans, he died for everyone. Now, I came into a real understanding of that particular part of scripture when I was 21 years old. When I became a Christian, my prejudices, my focuses on where I came from and where other people came from faded away. Faded away. Now some people say, if you say you don't see color, some I don't know what they say you are, but let me say it to you like this. I don't see color, but I see in color. That makes sense? Yeah. Color doesn't matter. I don't have a prejudice or a bias, but I can't help but see in color. This is a color TV. These eyes ain't colorblind, so I gotta see color. But it's not the thing that attracts me. It's not the thing that motivates me. It's when I look in the windows, the eyes are the windows to the soul. I love it. I say it over and over. Martin Luther King said it best. Judge a man not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character, period. And that has been my determination even before I was a Christian. And let me tell you how that works. When I was in jail when I was young, and I've never told you this story, it was a time when you had the black power movement where you had black people who just hated white people. And then you had these white people that just hated black people. And then you were in the middle. Not just you, but other black people, other white people, other Spanish-speaking people, all kinds of people. But they're all trying to make you take a side. Now, I remember being in maximum security and one day we come out to get our breakfast and the white racist and the black power advocate are in line together and all of a sudden they have a disagreement. The white guy slams a plate of food in the black guy's face. The black guy turns around and starts wailing on him. Now the whole place erupts. Pictures are flying, steel plates. I mean, I ain't did nothing. I'm just in line. Now I got to watch out for my head. So I'm trying to get out of here. I'm like, man, what's wrong with these people? I've seen things that you would not believe. I remember one time we were sitting in the TV room and Diana Ross kissed Bob Hope on the cheek on the national television and a brother said, man, our queen just kissed that white pig on his face. I mean, yes. And then, oh yeah, we're good. You know, and it goes back and forth. We're sitting there going, man, are these people nuts? 
Because that wasn't my life. I, I, didn't, I didn't come into contact with any of that until I went to jail. Where I grew up, I think I've told you this before, I was Polish. They didn't identify as white. Polish. There was Ukrainians, there were Italians, there were Frenchmen, there were Puerto Ricans, there were African Americans, and I was Polish. Polish. I don't think I understood the white thing until I went to jail. And I remember the first time I went to jail, and a brother said to me, you blue-eyed devil. I said, blue-eyed devil? I went into the bathroom, took my glass, took my eyes, and said, God, you're brown. They call me a blue-eyed devil. And my brother got green eyes, but I, I don't know, man, maybe he got colorblind or something. I didn't, I didn't understand it until I found out later that this was all connected to, you know, a particular focus on life. And so then what you find yourself in the middle of what I'm trying to say here is you've got this person who hates this person and this person who hates this person and people are trying to force you to make a decision based on your exterior which for me doesn't work. Now let me tell you why. When I was in jail, one of the dudes from my neighborhood came in. He's a white dude and I had made peace with everybody. I'm doing good. I got a great relationship with everybody. I don't work it out. He gets put in my cell. That night, some brothers threaten him and you know, they go put a whooping on him. I said, no, you know, he's from my neighborhood. You know, you, you, you know, bring me in this. I don't want to have to do this, but you know. So anyways, it turns out we got a war now. So we go to bed that night and at nighttime you hear, we, when you come out in the morning, we go, da, 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 we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. And then you gotta just wait. So in the morning I said, look, to the dude, I said, okay, man, here's what we gotta do. When we get out in the morning, Let's hope they open our cell first. That's the big thing. Because if they start on the other end, we in trouble. But if they let us out, we go right out into the day room. You grab a chair. I'll grab a chair. We'll stand back to back, and whatever happens, happens. Okay. Comes morning. Thank God. Our door opens first. I run out into the day room, grab my chair. <laughs> this dude pulled the door shut and locked himself back in the cell. Left me with, by myself. In a war I, I didn't even have to be in. Now, let me tell you, on that day, let me tell you what happened to Ronald Bronski. Color went away. Neighborhood went away. The only thing that mattered to me from then on was, who's got my back? I don't care where they come from, but I had to go back to my neighborhood. So then when I get home, boy, everybody going to know about you. They don't know about your character. So they can be sure not to trust you if they ever find themselves in a position. I don't want to be on the side of somebody because my exterior resembles theirs. And then when I need some help, they ain't there. That don't make no sense to me. I'm going to take these eyes, look in your eyes, and if I see something that I know is right and good, I'm going to join with you. And that's the way that's going to be. And if something happens to you, it happens to me. And I hope you feel the same. Amen? So now, here's what I'm talking about. You take that into Christianity. It says, excuse me, I'm sorry, I lost my place. So that you can answer for those who, if we are out of our mind, and it's for the sake of God, if we are in our right mind, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. So, when you become a Christian and you make an alliance, okay, maybe, maybe you didn't do this when you got saved, I don't know, but maybe my background did it, but I believe this is an example that Paul would have given. My family, after I got saved, is you. That's my family. You can ask my wife, when we was young, we would go out somewhere, I never, like going places where it wasn't a lot of Christians. Because all my life, whenever I went to places like that, and believe me, I can tell you some stories even after a Christian of how things turned south in public. And so there was a security that came with being saved because the people that I knew that were saved had this value that I had. And even in that group of people, you have to watch and look at people's eyes because all of them ain't for real anyway. But I'm talking about those who are like Paul and who want to be like Paul. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be genuine. We're supposed to be sold out. It says, right, it says what I just read. Um, 
when, when he says, for he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Have you ever said to yourself, like when my dad died, I said, dad, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I honor your name. I'm going to live my life so it honors your name. You ever done that before? Someone that you love that you want to honor with your life because they, you know, they were an example to you and, and uh, you, you wanted to be like them. That's what, that's what's happening here. We're supposed to be like Christ. He's supposed to be our example. He's supposed to be the one that we want to live for or live like. No longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So my primary commitment in life is what? As a Christian. My first commitment, of course, we already know what it should be. Old Testament tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? So my first commitment is to live my life like Christ for Christ. And if I do that, then I will make a huge impact on the world. I really believe that every one of us will. And the cool thing is, from what I told you in the beginning, we have the power to do it. Now, some people might want to try to love their enemy, but they don't have Christ in their heart. They're not going to find what they need to do that. Even those who know Christ sometimes have a hard time loving someone that's done a dirty deed to them, and uh, they still don't want to love them like Christ said to them. But when you acknowledge the Holy Spirit in you, he can transform your heart and give you a brand new. When you get a new life, and that's where I'm going with this, you get a whole new perspective and you get a whole new set of power, a whole, whole new set of values, a whole new, whole new world view. Amen. And we're not talking about this anymore. That's why I want to talk about it today. Being a Christian is so much more than just saying a prayer at the altar. It's an absolute transformation. It's a life change. It's a life commitment to a whole new kingdom. Amen? So verse 16 says, So from now on we regard one, no one from a worldly point of view. Now what does that mean? Regard no one from a worldly point of view. Well, let me give you some illustrations. If I'm a, if I'm a black person, I can't favor black people. If I'm a white person, I can't favor white people. If I'm a politician, I can't favor a specific political piece that isn't in line with God's word. If I'm a Republican, I can't favor Republicans. If I'm a Democrat, I can't favor Democrats. If I'm a socialist, I can't favor socialists. What I'm supposed to do according to the word of God, which is very clear right here, regard no one from a worldly point of view. A worldly point of view is identifying first with someone from the world and then taking their viewpoint and looking at the rest of the world through it. That's not an option for a Christian. And that's why when, this, when all this stuff took off this last year about racial relations and people started talking about black and white, for me it was confusing because for me a long time ago, long time ago I, I read this and said, I can't do this no more. So that's not me no more. And all I can be responsible for is me. How many of you can say amen to that? You can say what you want, but the only one whose power and authority that you have any control over is your own. Is your own. Is what choices you make. So that means if I find myself in a place where someone's being rude to someone, I should say something. If I find myself in a place where someone just stole something from the store, I should say something. If I find myself in a place where someone's violating the rules, whatever they are, of righteousness, of justice, I should be able to stand up and speak because I no longer regard things from a worldly point of view. And then he goes on, he says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Listen to this. So what he's saying is, there was a time when I looked at Jesus and he was just a man. And I looked at him from a worldly point of view. If you read through uh, 2 Corinthians right here, you'll find out that a worldly point of view of Christ was, basically the word says that those who don't know who Christ really is have a veil over their eyes. They can't see the truth because the devil has blinded them. I was blinded. And let me say this again today so everybody hears it clearly. The devil is real. Satan is a real person. He is a real entity. He has authority in this neighborhood, in this world. Amen. In fact, he has some significant authority on planet Earth. And so when we think about that, we need to recognize that um, 
We don't see Christ the way we used to. I don't. Before he was just an option, like a good guy, maybe a religious figure, maybe somebody who could help you, maybe not. But when he revealed himself to me and when the, and the Bible says the incorruptible seed was planted in my heart, all of a sudden the veil was pulled away. They use the illustration, if you read through the scripture, of here's a cool thing. You remember when Moses came down from the mountain and he was glowing? And he put a mask over his face to hide the glory because the people were afraid? Do you know that's a negative thing in the New Testament? Can you figure out why? I don't care if you're scared of God when you see him glowing out of me. That's your business. But if I try to cover it up, what's that saying? Uh oh, y'all might think I'm weird. And that's what Moses did. Moses shouldn't have done that. The scripture says, you know, that wasn't a cool thing Moses did. Don't cover up the glory. Let the glory shine out of you. Let the glory shine out of you. Be the person God calls you to be. Don't be trying to put a mask on. Amen. Now what? Here we go. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, okay, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we no longer, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The old is gone, the new has come. Hallelujah. And that's, to me, that's so important. Here's what it says in the NLT. It says, what this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. It doesn't say reformed persons. They are not the same anymore. For the old life is gone. Say that. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Remember the day you gave yourself to Christ? That day, a new life, an incorruptible seed, was born, began, and you began to go in another direction. Everything in your life should have begun to change. Amen? Amen. And then it goes on in verse 18, it says, All this newness of life is from God, who brought us back to himself through what Christ did. And God has given the task of reconciling people to him, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he, was given us, he has given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors, and God is using us to speak to you. We urge you, as though Christ himself were uh, here pleading with you, be reconciled to God, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. There's a lot being said right there. This is a wonderful message we've been given. The thing is this. How many of you are glad God forgave your sins? If you know Jesus, you know he wiped them clean, right? Not just the past, but the present and the future. You know that, right? All your sins have been forgiven. And then Jesus said, as you've been forgiven, you're supposed to what? Give up. Okay, so, let me use a personal illustration. I'm 15 years old, I'm in a gang, I get in a gang fight, and it's with Puerto Ricans. And a Puerto Rican stabs me in my face, right through, right here, right through my eye, cuts my eyelid in half, stabs me under this cheek, and then stabs me again in the back of my head, and then stabs me right here on my hand. Now, would you be liking Puerto Ricans if that was you? Just yes or no? How would you feel after someone stabbed you like that? Not a Christian. I mean, you just, you're, you're in the inner city. You're, you're, a, you're just an angry young man. After I got saved, could I still be angry at, at Puerto Ricans or at that boy or young man? According to this, I can't. No longer counting people's sins against them. You sinned against me, but I forgive you. And until, until this day, I have countless Puerto Rican friends. I mean, it's gone. That's what the gospel does. 
Now, we, we got politicians say they're going to make that happen. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think you're going to resolve all the issues between people. You're not going to forgive all their sins. You know why? Because you don't even believe sin exists anymore. Back in the 60s, uh, Carl Menninger wrote a book called What Happened to Sin? It was when he, as a psychologist, recognized that our country was removing the word sin from our vocabulary. There's nothing that's really sinful. When you take away sin, you take away any type of standard. When you take away a standard, there's no law. When there's no law, look where we are now. I don't know if you're reading and looking around, but lawlessness is on the rise. You can say whatever you want, but it is. And why is that? Because there's no standard. Because that's what happened to sin. It's gone. So now, if I do something for the right reason, it's not a sin anymore. All I got to do is have the right reason. For instance, if I'm starving and I steal something, it's not, it's not a sin anymore. That's me getting what I need to eat. That's not what the Bible says. It says when you're hungry, if you steal, you're forgiven. That's not a sin. It doesn't say that. It says thou shalt not steal. Right? No, that's hard. Maybe you don't want to accept that, but that's what the scripture says. So if you steal, it's stealing. If you kill someone, even if you murder someone, you're angry because they did something to you and you murder them, but they find it justified, it's still murder. If you lie, oh, but it was for the right reason. If I'd have told the truth, no. That's a standard, which is gone. We don't have a standard anymore. Now everything is subject to my truth. And there's no absolute truth. And without absolutes, what do we do? Where do we go? How do we, how do we, go, how do we navigate through society when everybody's got a different standard? And even the laws that we have, we don't even follow. They don't even mean anything anymore, depending on the situation. I mean, we're seeing it all over the country. There's prosecutors throwing cases left and right out of court, just letting people go loose from the jails. Man, I, you know what I said to myself the other day? I'm on the wrong side again. See, when I was a criminal, they was locking you up. Now I'm a righteous man, and they let the criminals go. It's like, man, you guys should have just stayed there. Now I'd finally be profiting. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I'm just talking about me, and I'm, I'm sure someone might see this, and I'm probably get some backlash, but I don't really care anymore. I'm just done thinking about what I can't say. My life has shown me some things. I have seen things with my eyes. <laughs> you know, you can't tell me I didn't see them. I wasn't there. You either have to listen to me and I have to listen to you and we need to go through it together and work something out. But you can't just expect me to not say nothing. Because I love the Lord and I believe he changes lives. And I believe when he changes someone's life, that life is genuinely changed for eternity. And more than anything, we don't need another political party. We need the kingdom of God to come for the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're called to. We're called to the establishment of the kingdom of God, reconciling sinners to one another and to God, to God first and to one another second. That's the ministry of reconciliation. You don't have to go to college. You don't have to have the education. You don't have any experience. All you got to do is ask God, how do I reconcile someone? That's pretty easy. Let me show you how it works. I got to say, I had hurt some people before. I went back to Chicago. Bill? Yeah, it's me, Ron Bronson. Oh, man, I'd like to knock you up. I think I'm just here to tell you. I'm really sorry what I did. Will you please forgive me? I've given my life to Christ. And I promise you now I'm not the same man anymore. Some people go, oh, okay. Some go, man, get you and Jesus too. Either way they go, it doesn't matter to me because I want them to know that God made me brand new and that whether they do or they don't is not going to make a difference because I'm not going to be the person I was no matter what you do. And it took years. My cousin told me just the other day, Ronnie, when you were young and you gave your life to Christ, we all said, he's just doing that to get out of jail. He's just doing that for this. And then she said, it was such an honoring thing to hear that now... 46 years later, they all got to shut their mouth. Now, you know why I'm telling you that? 
All glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, he can come inside your heart and make you brand new. And you, I can prove it. 46 years of proof. 46 years of a whole different life. Not perfect, but different. New. Go, definitely going in another direction. That's reconciling to God and then reconciling to others. All of us, I'm sure, in our life that have someone they don't like. Isn't that true? <laughs> that person is the one you need to reconcile with and needs to be reconciled to God if they're not. So it doesn't matter. You can forget all that other stuff. Just don't like somebody, whoever it is. There's your ministry of reconciliation. That's the beginning right there. If you don't like them because there's a whole group of reconciliation for you. But let's get busy sharing the love of God, the kingdom of God, and becoming part of this ministry of reconciliation. Because we, church, I'm, I'm just blown away sometimes. I, I just don't. We, we're just not talking about the resurrection. We're not talking about the crucifixion. We're not talking about uh, how we're supposed to live as Christians. We're not talking about having a standard. We're talking about 15 reasons why my marriage is successful because I'm a Christian. Six reasons why my kids should do this. I don't, that's great. But, but I'll tell you something. I don't care what your problem is. If you understand what I'm talking about today, you can fix it with the power of God. You don't have to have a, a long, drawn-out psychological perspective. All you have to do is have the power and the new life. And you can make a difference forever. And it don't cost you a penny. And so then after he says that, not counting men's sins against them, he says, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who has not, did not sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. something that I think Mike and I were talking about, about the fact that you can't have justice without righteousness. And you can't have righteousness without justice. And just let me close here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, verse 1, it says, As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. In other words, he said, look, I'm one of your fellow Christians, fellow workers for God, and I want to tell you, man, don't, just don't get God's grace in vain. Don't take his grace and do nothing with it. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you in the day of salvation. I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And, and then Paul goes on to say, because when you needed God, he was there. Please don't now use that grace that he showed you and then make it worthless. Make it in vain like it didn't matter. You have to remember. You remember? Do you remember when you were in that spot? I do. When I was like hopelessly lost, hope, hopelessly broken, had nowhere to go, had nothing to look forward to. I was just there. And then this person showed up. And now I'm going to forget that? Paul says, don't do that. Don't forget what God did for you. Remember what he did. He heard your voice. He came and helped you. Now is the day of salvation. Be his ambassador. Make his grace, his love, his patience, his goodness, his faithfulness, his kindness, his power to heal, his power to forgive, available through you to anyone you see in a position to hear about 
or receive it, no matter who they are. And if we all did that, we could fix things pretty quick. But it involves letting go, particularly of the past. Looking at today as a brand new day and tomorrow as a better day. I can't see any other way. You can argue about the past till you're blue in the face. It ain't going to change nothing. But if you start talking about what we're going to do today so the past don't happen again, then tomorrow's going to be different. I know that's true for me. <laughs> if I'd have just kept talking about it over and over again, all the issues I had, I'd still be talking about them. <laughs> and I'd probably be in prison somewhere. But when I decided to give love a chance, to give Christ an opportunity in my life, that made the difference. Amen? So let me encourage you today. Oh, one, one last thing. Verse 14, this is another issue that we have in our country today and in, in life in general. Uh, Paul was addressing this at the Corinthians. He said, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Be Be Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. What does that mean? I mean, how many deals are we making now with people who are unbelievers? You I mean, I've talked to some Christians who say, yeah, one of my really good friends is, you know, not a Christian. Real good friends? Okay, I'm, I'm struggling here. I think you can love someone who's not a Christian, but I don't know that you want to be mixing your life. Sooner or later, the, it's like when you look back at Israel and you see how the Philistines and all the different, the Amorites, the Hivites, all the motherites out there, they came into Israel and pretty soon Israel was corrupt and God was no longer God. That's what happens when we start going into these partnerships for the sake of tolerance and understanding, instead of saying, no, I don't agree with you, no, I, I can't accept that, but I have no problem living life with you, I have no problem letting you live life, let's, let's, let's serve, let's serve together, let's be kind to one another, but I don't have to agree with you, and I don't have to be a partner, and I think that's something we've lost, church, and, and, and little by little, the world has creeped into the church. And now what God's doing, and I believe this, and I'll, I'll, you'll hear it more than you're hearing it from me right now. I'll, usually I'm about a few years ahead of what, what goes on. There's going to be a time coming up when the world is going to separate from the church, I guarantee you. And only those who believe what this word of God says are going to be faithful. The scripture is clear in Matthew 24, in the last days. Even the elect would become cold, their love will go cold towards one another and could be deceived if it wasn't for God's mercy. So keep that in mind. And I would encourage you, again, keep your lamp filled with oil. Keep your eyes on the prize. Put Christ at center in your life and know the word. Know what you believe. Don't trust it for someone else to tell you what it is. Research it for yourself. That's what's happening today all over the place. People are not looking for themselves. They're just listening to the sound bites and everybody's going with whatever's going on. Instead of digging into the word and knowing who God is and having a deep relationship with him, which is what it's going to take when, when things start, if, if they start to, if they collapse. So I'll leave it there. Let's pray. Amen. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you that you are a healer. You're a deliverer. You give us life. You loved us when we were unlovely. You command us to love those who we might consider unlovely. Lord, it's your desire for us to care for those who may be regarded as the least, for those who may be regarded as lost, or for us to be uh, reconcilers, to be a friend, uh, 
or to be someone who's a resource, someone who, can, who cares, Lord God, someone who wants to see change, someone who wants your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. Help us to be that people, Lord God. Help us to hone our skills as reconcilers, Lord God. Give us wisdom. Give us uh, understanding, Father, that we can be truly, Lord, ambassadors for your kingdom, representatives for what and who you are. And Lord, in closing, I, I do want to take just a moment to say thank you so much. God, Father God, for sending your son, Jesus. And Jesus, I thank you so much for saying yes. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he saith, not, but not my will, but your will be done. Thank you that you took that perfect life, Lord, and you went to the cross. And you hung on that cross, Lord. And you cried, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Where are you? And the sins of the world fell on you, separated. I want to thank you, Jesus, for, for following through. I want to be like you, Lord. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for being present right now, for being our counselor, Lord. Our guide. place and Lord I thank you for your perfect plan when the devil thought that he had won and Jesus was laying in the grave and everybody figured it was over they finally killed this crazy radical guy and now that uh, put an end to his story and his talk whether whatever he was and then three days later boom you got up hmm. not only did you get up but you went around and hung out with a few folks so they would know you got up. Showed them the scars on your hands, feet. Rose, ascended into heaven. You said you had to go because you were preparing a place for us. I thank you, Lord, that I have that to look forward to. That one day I will lose this body and I won't be just a spirit wandering around in the middle of a whole bunch of other spirits, but there's another body waiting for me. <laughs> I'm still going to be me. <laughs> Only it'll be brand new, complete in you. Oh, what a day that will be. Can't wait to see those who have gone before me, Lord God. Just want to say, And as the world moves closer to your plan, Lord, keep us safe. Keep us focused. Keep us committed. Help us to be the men, women, young men, young women, boys and girls that you have called us to be. And I want to say, Maranatha, come, Lord. We need you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so now if we, I, that was just a lead into communion. Um, uh, I just wanted us to remember who it is we're celebrating when we now uh, take a moment to do as he commanded us to do. Communion. Yes. You know, you all know this story, you know, on the night that Jesus was betrayed. I mean, you got to think about that. He had 12 men he hung around with, and one of them, 
Think about this for a minute. Betrayed him with a kiss. I mean, just imagine if you had a really, really good friend and they gave a kiss to you and it exposed you and caused you to die. What a horrible thing to endure. But on that same night, <laughs> before that event took place, that supper, Jesus said, you know, pretty soon I'm not going to be here anymore. And when I'm gone, I want you to remember me. I want you to do something so you won't forget the things I told you. So you won't forget who I am. And there was bread and there was wine on the table. And he reached over and he took a loaf of bread and he broke a piece off. And he said to his disciples, this is my body. This is my body, which will be broken for you. Take of it eat. And then immediately following, he picked up a cup of wine and he said, this is my blood, which will be shed for you for the remission of sins. When you drink it, remember me until I return. And they drank together. And I often think about this night because I wonder what the disciples were thinking. I mean, really. Did they really think he was going to get up from the grave? I don't think they even understood what was going on until after it all happened. So many times in life, isn't that the thing? Like they say, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. You see things a lot clearer after it happened. So let's just remember this. Jesus went to the grave and stayed there for three days, and then what happened? He got up. So let's just give a hand clap of praise to the risen Savior. <laughs> Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Praise you. Thank you, uh, Lord, for this night, thank, day, I mean, and thank you guys. It's been awesome this morning. Problems and all. We still got to worship. Got to hear the word. Amen. Fellowship. Right. Amen. 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 Amen.